welcome, guys. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you're at right now. Um, hopefully, you guys can hear me well now at this point. Uh, right, Rachel, right thanks, thanks for kicking us off. And today, uh, as, as a poll kind of alluded to, we'll talk about performance tuning the BI platform. Now, uh, my email address is on the screen right now. It's bnight at pragmaticworks.com. And my Twitter address is actually Brian Knight as well, so at Brian Knight. Uh, so today, we're, uh, I, from hearing from you guys, you want to hear it all. So we want to, we're going to cover the IS portions, the AS portions, and also a little bit about the database platform as well. So we'll focus on really tuning the BI environment. It's really about tuning the entire stack, including reporting services, by the way, as well. But we'll talk about the entire stack, starting with IS, AS, and RS. So let's, let's quickly do a whiteboard session first to make sure I cover a few pieces here. Okay, oh, my Zuma tool's turned off. Uh-oh, I'm lost without it. So as we know in BI, typically we have our, our source system right here, which replicates over to the data warehouse. All right, so we have our source system, maybe OLTP, and we might have lots and lots of OLTP environments, Excel spreadsheets, whatever, kind of, kind of all replicating this environment. This is typically going to be the SSIS behind the scenes or T-SQL behind the scenes to get that data in there. After we do that, we have the data going into a cube, and this is our BI environment. Oh, that's a terrible drawing. I want one of the, I want one of the uh, awards on Sesame Street next, next week. Uh, this is our data warehouse here, our cube, SSAS cube here. And then lastly, we have a reporting environment. So we might have tons of reports right here, tons of SharePoint environments. Now, people may, I'll call this reports, and we'll have SharePoint. And we have Excel as well, all operating against this. And maybe sometimes also going against the warehouse. So tuning the BI environment is pretty complex, as you can see. It involves SSIS for retrieving data out of the OLTP environment into our data warehouse. It also involves tuning that data warehouse so data can be retrieved much more efficiently. We also have a layer here for the cube and tuning the cube layer. And how do, we, how do we think about the processing of the cube, the querying of the cube, and making it much more efficient? And our MDX running against it. We also have the reporting services server, and how do we scale that out appropriately as well? So inside the Microsoft BI stack, we can, of course, put all these uh, components you're seeing on the screen right now on one server, but that's highly, unrec uh, highly unrecommended. You, know, you definitely do not want to do that in, your, in many cases. If I was looking at my BI environment, which would include the data warehouse cube and reports, Typically, you're going to try to try to isolate the cube at a minimum off of that data warehousing platform. So if you only had two servers to buy, the data warehouse and IS can potentially go on the one box, and the cube and reporting you can put wherever you would like. But uh, the, the, the report, the, uh, the cube pieces, you would typically want to separate that out very quickly. So if, as you start to scale from a small environment, cube environment, to a large environment, uh, a medium to me, a small to me is typically going to be under 20 gigs for the cube. Uh, after you cross that 20 to 50 gig big realm, you typically are going to want to uh, separate that cube environment out. All right, so kind of zooming out here, let's kind of go back into our agenda. So what we're going to cover is really how to tune each of these platforms, how do we make it much more easy for yourself, and some of the gotchas you'll find around that. So we typically have the DBA versus the developer, right? And each person has a role in the tuning effort that we'll talk about now. So today we're going to talk about how to tune our packages and build a better package for everyone. We'll also talk about building a better cube, which is going to involve the DBA and the developer. And then lastly, we're talking about the database platform, all the SQL components, and how do we store data much more efficiently. So we're kind of at that tipping point now. Before, we found data was, was uh, you know, 10 years ago. If I ask you guys how many of you guys have been in IT for more than 10 years, probably a good portion of you guys number SQL 6.5. And of those that have been in IT for more than, more than 10 years, you remember when SQL Server was frowned upon for having a large implementation on it. So you would not have a multi-terabyte data warehouse on SQL. However, nowadays we're seeing that as, as really kind of norm. It's not unusual to have a terabyte data warehouse. I'm dealing with a customer right now that's going to put a quarter of a petabyte in SQL Server all over overall. That's 250 terabytes in a SQL Server data warehouse. So interesting data like that is not unheard of anymore. There's lots of options we can do for SQL Server to do that. Now, if I'm looking at, I'll talk about that instead on the database platform. So we're, let's talk about IS first. On the IS side, there's really we want to tune the sources, the transforms, and the destinations. Let's start with our sources first. 
And this is all going to be in the data flow. So most by half of you guys mentioned you wanted to learn more about IS. Let's cover that portion first, and we'll cover AS, then we'll cover the database platform. So the first piece is don't be afraid to use T-SQL. Just because we're, we're using SSIS doesn't mean we should use every component in SSIS, sort transforms, aggregate transforms, things like that. There's an old saying that says when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And that's what a lot of SSIS developers that we go into uh, think of SSIS as that big, everything's a nail. And uh, you know, SSIS is a hammer in this case. So every problem is not that nail. So we should find a way to, to use the best tool for the right job. Things like sorting data, aggregating data perhaps. If we're reading data out of a SQL Server or Oracle or DB2, we should use this native query language to do as much as we can inside that language. So things like typecasting, null coalescing, all those kind of things all make sense there. If you instead you're reading data with flat files, there's a property called FastParse, which is a fantastic property for scaling SQL Server. We'll cover that one in a second. The last one is, is adjusting the packet size when we're trying to connect to any OLAVB compliant data source. So it's about the fast parse first. When you're reading data out of a text file, or if you're doing data conversions, those are the two pieces that you'll, do, you'll, you'll worry about this at, data conversion transform, and also a flat file source. And these, and these two components, they, they, there's a contract between, uh, between SSIS and this data source. And basically what that means is data is coming out of the, of the data source. It's going to be validated to make sure this is actually a, a date or a number or whatever. This just applies to numbers and dates typically. All right, so there's a contract. As data comes out, SSIS is going to run a parser to make sure that that data is actually a number or a date. Okay, so after that... It takes a while I'll do that, but if you trust the data, if the data is, is from a trusted source, maybe a DB2 data source, dump this data into a flat file, and you trust this data, then that parsing routine is kind of secondary. You don't really care about that parsing routine. So in those cases, what you can do is you can turn on fast parse to avoid that. And it saves about 20 to 30, actually in some kinds of cases, 40% on your performance. So there's some pros and cons on this, but what I want to share with you now is, is, a, is a big feature inside of SSI, inside of uh, SQL Server in general. Oh, it's a fairly good. Um, there's a big feature inside of SQL Server Enterprise Edition, and this is in 2008 for compression of data. What this means for you is we can select data out of a SQL Server much, much faster. So our gain in performance for select queries may go up by 175% in many cases, I see many cases. However, your insert, uh, your insert performance may go down. And that's what this, is, this slide right here is showing. It's showing that as we turn on compression, there's two types of compression. One is a data type, data type kind of compression. And the data type kind of compression is going to eat performance. It's, it's basically just compressing. Uh, if I'm inserting a number of one, it won't use a full integer size. It just uses one byte instead of four bytes. That's row compression. Page compression is where I compress the entire page, much like WinZip does for files. It would do for this. So page compression is about a three to one ratio in compression. However, However, um, the, the issue there, I'm sorry, John, I, I see your message about the, the, the echo, but unfortunately, I hate to, just, I hate to uh, is, there, is there an echo that people are hearing as well? I, I'm, I'm not hearing an echo at all, and um, we've gotten no more comments about it. So, John, maybe you should uh, try to adjust your speakers, perhaps, or your audio settings. Okay. All right. Sorry. I didn't want to didn't dis, dis rail. Uh, I'm in a room right now that might have a little bit of an echo, but uh, um, it... Uh, it has a T1 dedicated to it, so I hate to, I hate to uh, worry about, I hate to, to mess it up. So the, uh, and some people are saying no echo to the web, so that might help you as well. Um, so on the compression type, the page compression is a much more aggressive, usually about a three to one compression ratio. Now this improves your select queries enormously, especially on the data warehouse side. If you're reading data of a data warehouse, compression makes sense on every single fact table you have. So it was a lot of repeating data. However, update performance and, and insert performance goes down. So you're going to see a CPU kick when you do this, and you'll see an uptick in your CPU um, hit, 
And you're also going to see a, a downward performance on things like uh, on things like insert statements, about a 20 to 30 percent hit in performance for those. For, but for BI loads, for warehousing loads, this makes a lot of sense. Okay, so let's let's jump into a demo on tuning these data sources. So in this demo, I'm going to focus uh, I'm going to focus on the the data source tuning in SSIS. All right, let me hop over here real quick. Nick, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask me anytime. I'll kind of keep an eye on that, that question panel. And what I'm going to open up is a package here that's on that blog. And I want to start with the fast parse property first. I want to show you where this is at so you can implement this in your environment right now. Again, this fast parse property is going to skip the parsing process for flat files. And it saves you about a, you know, anywhere from a 20 to 40% gain when you're reading lots of data out of flat files. What I'm going to do is I'm first going to run a query with fast parse turned off. This is the native way, the default way is fast parse turned off. And what this is going to do, we're going to read data out. And we'll see that it just goes to a dead end right now. So it's just nothing's happening at all. Let me go over to progress and let's see how long this took. This took about uh, 6.2 seconds to run right now. All right. So let me try this with fast parse turn on. Let me show you how to turn it on. So we'll turn it on by right clicking on the source and going to show advanced editor. Now that show advanced editor is, is the things that Microsoft does not want you to see by default from a usability perspective. I'm going to go to my input output properties. We'll see my red line is here and my green line coming out of my source is right here. So as I expand the green line and go to output columns and on a column by column basis, you'll select the column and you'll turn the fast parse property to true. And this, this, this basically tunes that data source. It tunes the flat file data source because as data comes out, that one column will not be parsed and it saves you a good kick in performance for each one. Now, it's surely not a silver bullet, but it definitely helps us uh, as we do this. So as I run this package now, we we're 6.8 seconds before. Let me run the package now with fast parse turned on. We'll see, there it goes. Now, visually, the data it looks, like, it looks like it's coming out faster, and it feels faster, definitely not 6, 8, six, eight seconds. We're actually at 3.3 seconds now, so we got about a 45, 50% gain in performance here by doing very little at all, just turning on a fast parse property. So if you have large files that you're reading out, then this property makes a lot of sense. Fast parse is on a column by column basis. Now, most of you guys, though, are reading data out of an OLADB source of some sort, or an ODBC source. So let's talk about how to tune that one. So I'll look at this AdventureWorks connection right here. And I go over to my connection properties. Now, one of the properties you'll see in this connection manager you can't see it. You cannot see it in the core connection manager. So a few things. You want to make sure that first of all, if you're running SQL Server, ideally use a native client. That's that's where a lot of the improvements in performance are going to happen. At one of the such improvements for any OLED provider is a property called packet size. Now, this is going to apply for connections into analysis services and connections into SSIS as well. So, for reading data in analysis services, you want to use this as well in your connection properties. This packet size, by default, is set to zero. Or for Oracle or DB2, it's set to nothing. Actually, the property doesn't even show itself there in most cases. Now, I've adjusted it 32K. Now, what this basically means is imagine I've got an environment where I'm reading data out of a SQL server over here, and I am over here. What's going to happen, so this is my SIS package right here, and server, server two, and I've got my server one right here, my SQL box, now what happens is I request data, I request data from SQL Server 1, and I say I want to get some, I want to get some packets of data. Now what SQL Server is going to do is going to say, well, I see that your connection setting does not, does not specify a packet size. I'm going to downgrade you then to 4K. So that's the, that's the, uh, uh, the, the default packet size is 4K for SQL Server. So it says I want 4K of data. All right, I acknowledge you want 4K of data. All right, I acknowledge your acknowledgement. Here's the 4K of data. I got the packet of data. So we're seeing this back and forth, back and forth kind of segue back and forth to SQL Server just to get 4K of data. So what ideally we want to do is if we can't, we can't stop this chattiness. Now Windows 2008 does eliminate some of those back and forth uh, chattiness in, in IP. However, if we do something like the 32K, at least when we get that data, 
we're, we're chatting back and forth for bigger buckets of data, not the smaller buckets. Okay, so that's, that's one of the things we can do around that. So, 32K will specify that we're going to get 32K assault time. Now, notice this actually adjusts my connection string. So, let me kind of copy this out of the notepad so you guys can see this. So, you'll see in notepad that I got this property here called packet size. That same property would apply in many of the providers, like the Oracle provider for DB2, I'm sorry, the Oracle provider for Oracle, and the Microsoft provider for DB2 as well. Now, there are some caveats, as Stephen is pointing out here as well. Uh, for, this is just for large data sets, typically. You want to, this is something you want to do for large data sets, but for smaller data sets, it may not make sense. One of the caveats that may apply is, let me go to my network settings here. Okay, I always make the mistake of going to the wrong network setting here. Let me just go. There we go. All right, I'm killing myself here. I'm going to go to control panel. Okay, so if I go over to, now this gave me a, a good size gain in performance before. Now when I say, I say before, let me go to network. Let me show you one of the caveats that we're going to see. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to, I'm going to, go to uh, see all the network computers and devices. Oh, I'm sorry. They've moved this around now since the uh, 2000, 2008 days. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. I'm clicking on it. Nothing's happening. Oh, okay, whatever. I'll go the old-fashioned way instead. Okay, and that is looking at my adapter settings and going into... So one of the things I want to show you is that in my case, when I... Oh, are you serious? Okay, so something I've installed has removed my admin permissions, unfortunately. So... 32K, by the way, is a maximum. So for Brian's question, 32K is a maximum. And one of the things that we have to do is you'll see that as I'm, deplo as I'm deploying this data across a network, um, as I'm, uh, you're, that the network card has a setting. So let me, let me kind of zoom in real quick and kind of whiteboard this. All right, so I, got, I have my server over here, which I drew before, my SSIS the package over here. Now, SSIS is, of course, running on a server as well. And it may have a network. Uh, oh. All right, my drawing skills are train wreck today. All right, my server right here is communicating with my server over here. That server has, has, has a package, of course, is running. And that this server has a network card going into it. This server has a network card going into it, of course. And I've got SQL Server running over here. And I've got over here also, I've got a switch somewhere in here as well. Each of these components has something to say about what my packet size is. So my, first of all, my SIS package has a connection string. So I've got a connection string here. I've got in the card, there's something called jumbo packets. So this is by default turned on in many of the Cisco switches, our Cisco um, card, our uh, Intel cards and those kind of things. It's called jumbo packets. The same thing would apply here. This is what the property called jumbo packets here. Most modern network cards have this turned on. Most switches have this turned on, but the network administrator has something to say about that also. So there's a property here called jumbo packets. These have to be turned on for this to work. Otherwise, I get downgraded. Same thing over here, and same thing in SQL Server. I have to turn on make sure that there's nothing overriding the setting. So if any one of those settings are turned off, then I get downgraded to whatever the lowest common denominator is. Now, what is the benefit of all this? The benefit of doing all this is ultimately I will see a huge gain in performance. I mean, I, 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 at, at uh, reading data out of, out of DB2, for example, when we did this, we saw about a 40% gain in, in our package runtime by doing this. So it's not just a, a nice little nice to have. And in some cases, in that case, was a huge gain in our silver bullet in that case. Okay, the next piece around this, let me kind of... Open back our slides again. So we talked about the, the fast parse property, and we also talked about the, the network packet size property as well. So the next piece is really, how does the buffers work inside of SSIS? What, what happens is what, what we do is we, we fill up 10K buffers, or sorry, 10 meg buffers, 10 meg buffers by default. And I fill up a 10 meg buffer, and I send it downstream. Now this is if, Everything is called a synchronous component. Let's talk about this. We'll talk about that in a second. So a synchronous component means as I read data out, I send it to the next component. Think of that, that bucket brigade inside, of, inside the old 1930s movies. We're trying to put out a, a fire. 
and I scoop a, scoop a bucket out of the, out of the stream, I pass it to the next guy, he does something with it, and he passes it on down, and on down, and on down. If everything is synchronous like that, we would only be using 10 mags of buffers for each of these components. So each component is, is, sync, is basically passing data on in a very parallel fashion. So what you see right here is that 30 megs of data can be worked on at any point in time, which is pretty darn good. That, again, that's 10 megs or 10,000 rows for each bucket of data, whichever comes first. And that can be adjusted for you also. So the problem with that is, let's go back to that bucket brigade. So there's another type of component called asynchronous components. Now, so far I've talked about only synchronous components. Inside of asynchronous components, what would happen is, let's imagine um, I, get a, uh, I hand a bucket to you, and you say, this bucket looks a little fragile. I'm going to empty the, bu bu the, 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 the bucket of water into a new bucket and then pass a new bucket down. That's a partially blocking asynchronous component, meaning that there's a, a slight blockage at the buffer level as I empty the data into the new buffer and pass that on down. That causes a slight lag in your, in your package. Things like the union all transform have that component uh, a slowdown. The worst one we can do is a, is a fully blocking asynchronous component. And what that means is as I get this bucket of data, I'm going to put it on the ground and wait until I receive all the buckets of data before I pass this down. Things like the sort transform and the aggregate transform are two components that fall in that category. Those are the worst components we can use in SSIS and cause huge, huge slowdowns in SSIS. So, oh, there we go. Just to give you a, a, a quick performance tip that we found, as I'm looking at data coming out of this, this right here, I'm reading data out, I'm doing a lookup. If I can't find a lookup, I send it down this red line, do a derived column, assign a default value, and I send it back to the union all component. Now, on the right one, I'm reading 100 million rows out. I'm doing a lookup. If I can find the, if I find, if I don't, if I don't find the record, I assign the default value here using condition if then condition. Now, the gain in performance is really pretty drastic. 105 second package becomes 83 seconds by doing this. So, the worst components you can use uh, from John's question here are going to be the aggregate transform and the sort transform. Those are the worst ones you can use. Partially blocking, what's causing this slowdown here is this partially blocking component right here called the union all. I'm having to create two trees of data, so I'm actually having to parallel, even though it looks like it's parallel, it looks like it's better because it's parallelizing it. Unfortunately, it's causing a branch in my, my, my trees of my memory, and it's causing some threading issues potentially also. So you want to watch out for fully blocking components like the sort transform and aggregate, and partially blocking like the union all can sometimes, sometimes be avoided. Now, it, it depends on how large of a package you have. One of the common patterns we see also is updating data. And how do we tune the updating data process inside of SIS? So let's imagine you have large, large changes that are happening. And you want to update, you want to figure out, I want to figure out if, if it's an update, I go this way. If it's an insert, I go this way. So the merge syntax makes a lot of sense inside of SQL Server 2008, but also you want to try to get into a set-based mindset. So let me show you an example of what I mean by that. Okay, I'm going to hop over here real quick, and I'm going to open this package up, and I want to show you two techniques here. Now, well, first thing you want to, I want to show you is, is another technique for avoiding the sort transform. You might now things like pulling data out of a flat file. It might make sense to use a, uh, you know, it might make sense to use a sort. But let's say first of all, I want to avoid using that sort transform. What we can do, I'm going to go over here and of course do an order by statement. That makes sense. I, I've ordered my data here instead of in my in my uh, SIS component using a sort transform. But that's not good enough for SIS. Even though I've sorted the data, SSIS does not know that data is sorted. So things like the merge join requires a sorted data set. And I don't want to put a sort transform on each of these. What I do is I right-click on the data source, and I say Show Advanced Editor. Okay, after I do that, I go to Input Output Properties. Again, you're seeing the green line and the red line. The green line says, first of all, this data is already sorted. All right, that, that, that helps me there. And then inside that green line, 
under alpha columns, I need to specify how is the data sorted. So you'll see on the right there's a sort key position column. And right now it's set to zero. That means the data is not sorted by that column, but for my transaction ID, you'll see I've got a sort key position of one. That means I'm sorting by that column first. A sort key position of two would mean I'm sorting by that column and then, this, then the next column second, and so on. We could also have said a negative one for sorting descending. This is letting SSIS know that first of all the data is sorted, yes, and then what column is sorted by. So by doing that, I no longer need a sort component. So what I want to show you is, is this upsert pattern next. And this upsert pattern is a really, really handy, handy pattern. Let me actually open up a, a quick okay, CDC. There we go. And I'm going to update some data real quick. I'm going to update about 100,000 records. And this is a really common mistake I see people make. So I'm going to go over to AdventureWorks real quick. There we go. So I, I deleted 100,000 records, and I updated about 800, 800 records. So what we're going to see is this, this package is much, it's going to be much slower because of this update records component right here. When I right-click on it and I run this package, watch how long this takes to run. Okay. So, what we're seeing is that as I, as I bring this data out, that 100,000 rows are going down this pipe right here, and we're, just, we're seeing it slowly happen. On the left pipe, we're seeing rows are, are updated row by row. And the reason why this is slow right now is I'm using an old ADB command transform. That transform should be avoided if at all possible, and the reason why it's basically doing updates inside of a row by row batch, much like a cursor does for you guys inside of T-SQL. So what I want to do instead of this is a pattern I've been trying to advocate. Now, if you trust me, this takes about four and a half minutes to run normally. Okay, so I'm going to kind of hop over to my other version of this. Now, this time, I'm going to send my updates this time into a staging area. So I'm inserting my updates. Okay, that seems kind of strange, doesn't it? And then when I go to my control flow, you'll see I'm doing a set-based update in my control flow. So I have a transaction that looks a little bit like this, just a basic T-SQL statement, where I'm updating my final table, and I'm setting my, my, my columns, but I'm doing an inner join to my stating table to get the data out of. So I'm doing a one big update versus a row-by-row -row update. And I do this in the transaction night, and I purge my, my, transact, my, my uh, staging table at the end. So again, it was about four and a half minutes before. Let me run this again, and let's watch how fast this is now. Okay, so let me jump into this. So I just executed it. I'm waiting for the file. There we go. And I'm done. So I had, again, 100,000 inserts, about 795 updates this time. All of that happened inside of, of two seconds, 1.6 seconds. A 99% gain in performance from four and a half minutes to 1.6 seconds in gain in performance. So we're seeing a huge gain by doing a very simple change. And again, the simple change we did, the pattern that you really want to think about, is do not do updates inside the data flow because it's row by row. Now, there are some components out there that get you around this. Uh, for example, we make a component at, at Pragmatic Works called the Update Batch Transform, which updates rows in a batch fashion. And we also have an upsert destination, which does all that update upsert logic as well. So those are two components that you can download as well that make that much, much easier. And that's part of a product we, we sell called Task Factory. But those are, those are the, the key components I want to make sure I, I, I bake into your head there is, is that one piece. Now, the next piece is really around the destination. And the destination also has some pros and cons as well. So let me hop over here. There we go. So the destination has two modes to it. There's, first of all, there's a fast load mode. And there's also a regular mode as well. Now, this slide is a little bit dated now. So that, that second bullet you see down there about SQL Server Destination, do not, do not use the SQL Server Destination anymore. They've actually, uh, they've, the pros of it now have, have um, gone away. In Service Pack 2 of SQL Server, they, they, they locked down SQL Server. But unfortunately, when they locked down SQL Server, they took away the pros of the SQL Server Destination. So, the old principles still apply. You want to lock your table if you can. And the old principles about 
inserting into a table that has no indexes also applies as well. So let me just show real quick a few things about this. First of all, when I open up this, this staging table I had before, you'll see that by default we have a max insert commit size of nothing, zero. I also have fast load turned on. Now, if you trust your destination, if you've got a pretty good destination insert, always use fast load. It's basically doing a bulk operation. The operation you're going to see by default is table or view, which does a row by row insert instead of a bulk operation. Now, the next thing we should look at tuning is this max insert commit size. Now, that max insert commit size is right now saying, I want to do one big batch commit. And that's not going to work really well, is it? So I'll see my SQL Server at like 2% utilization, and then all of a sudden, bam, I, inside, I try to commit 4 million rows. So I want it to do one uh, uh, more, more realistic commits. Now for large data sets, maybe you'll use 80,000 rows. Every 80,000 rows, you want to do a big batch uh, commit. It's up to you, uh, but your goal is to ultimately make sure your SQL Server is not getting pegged the last second. You want to you stream those commits in. Every 50,000 rows, do a commit. Um, you also sometimes want to tweak this setting here called rows per batch. How many rows am I going to batch into SQL Server e each time into the transaction log? That can be adjusted, and that's at best to be a trial by, trial by error kind of, kind of scenario. You want, to, you want to kind of play with that setting. Also, one of the settings that we looked at earlier was the, I mentioned uh, it's 10,000 rows per buffer, or 10 megs. Typically speaking, you can adjust this also on the downward side and do some trial and error and tune it and figure out, is, this, is it helping me or hurting me by making it 9,000 or 8,000? I typically see a number between 8,000 and 11,000 is that sweet spot. Uh, 10,000 is, is rarely the perfect number, but it's a good starting spot. And on wide data sets, you want to make that number smaller. So you'll make your payload a smaller data set, maybe 8,000. For narrower, narrower you want uh, data set, you might make it uh, you know, 11,000. So it all depends. Okay, so the rows per, uh, yes, yeah, so the question here is, should the, should the rows per batch, let me actually open this up again, should the rows per batch, that should be, this number right here should be smaller than the commit size. Because you, you can't have one outweigh the other, otherwise, otherwise SQL is going to make some adjustments and hurt you. So this number, the top number should be smaller than the bottom number. Okay, one more thing around this also. There is an infrastructure called the Data Warehousing Fast Track, which is a reference architecture by Microsoft. It's a good read. It's a, it's a methodology, a white paper you can read, and you can implement some of the best practices in it. In actuality, it's not just a methodology, but it's also going to be a, a, um, a hardware set of hardware requirements as well. Now, if you can't do all the hardware requirements from HP or IBM or Dell, then the next best thing is to do it, just the methodology, and try to get as close to it as you can. So one of the methodology statements there is, is, is around minimizing fragmentation. And if you want to really minimize fragmentation, data should be loaded into the destination already pre-sorted by the clustered index. So if I know that I've got a clustered index in SQL Server on my order date, perhaps, I should sort data from my source by order date as well. Okay, now by doing that, it gives me a few advantages. If I, if I order the data on the source and it streams into the destination already pre-ordered, it's going to make things less fragmented, ultimately. So very, very, def I mean, we're going to lay the data down on data on down disk, defragmented. And a few more things also. Uh, there's a trace flag I'm going to talk about in a second that will ultimately, if we tell SQL Server this data is already pre-ordered by using a trace flag and, and, and using an order statement in the, in, the, in the destination, then ultimately that's going to make the data flow down and it's, it's going to turn on minimal logging inside of SQL Server. So very little transaction log space will be used as it's inserting data. Now what you'll do is you'll go to the advanced properties of the destination, go to advanced editor, and under input output properties, I'm oh, sorry, uh, uh, component properties, excuse me, under component properties, you will see, it's got fast load turned on. Now, there's also these fast load options. Now, these fast load options that you're seeing down here resemble what you see here for things like um, uh, BCP, bulk insert. And because we've resembled that, we can do order statements here and say column name descending. 
something like that. Not some exact call name and exact statement here, but by doing this, it's going to lay the data. It's going to tell SQL Server this data set is already ordered, and it's ordered by my clustered index if I have one. And by doing that, it's ultimately okay, this is this is for like a the large large data sets. It's not going to be for the small data sets. This one is for a huge you know million multi million record multi billion record data set that you care about this. In most cases, 90% of your tables, it's not going to be big enough to even care about it. But if I tell the data is ordered, and I have that trace flag turned on, which I'll talk about in a second, 1117, uh, it will ultimately speed up my insert. It's going to use minimal logging. And also, my select queries become much more efficient as well, because I'm reading data already pre uh, uh, no, fra for no fragmentation on, and it's been, it's been laid out on disk in an optimal way. So we'll discuss that more in a second, but I just want to show you you can do that here. And of course, you would sort the data up here with the, the statement, that the, the, kind of the, the ways I showed you to pre-sort the data already. Let's go hop over to our slide deck again. OK, let me kind of hop through that real quick. So there's other things that we, won't, we wanted to talk about now as the services. For a lot of you guys, we'll come back to IS if you have some more time as well. But a lot of you guys were concerned about analysis services. So there's really three things to consider when you tune an analysis service cube. The first one is, do I have attribute relationships on my dimensions? We'll cover what those are in a second. The second one is, do I have attribute relationships on my dimension? And the third one is, do I have attribute relationships on my dimension? So seriously, this is actually a, a really, really big deal. If you do not have attribute relationships on your dimension, which we'll cover what they are in a second, it will cause some serious problems. Now, these are used in a lot of areas, but basically what they are, first of all, think of these, if I try to draw a parallel to SQL Server, these are basically um, relationships between your different columns inside of analysis services. So inside of a single dimension, maybe it's a product dimension, maybe it's a, a date dimension, there's a relationship between days and months, and months and quarters. And if you set those relationships up right, it helps you a number of ways. It's going to help you, first of all, with query performance. And I'll cover why that is in a second. It's also going to help you with aggregation design. So as we're designing aggregations, those aggregations require less, less um, uh, a space inside of your cube. They also help you with security. So if I say there's a correlation between a region southeast and Florida, and I say you cannot see the southeast, it's going to prevent my users from dragging over things like Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, because there's a relationship between those. And lastly, it's going to give you something called member properties, which helps you a lot later. We'll cover that reason in a second as well. So let me take a quick time out here and do another demo. So question from Brandy, does every dimension need attribute relationships? Uh, every dimension that has relationships to, does, does need that. So it, um, oh, should there be one, more than one relationship in a hierarchy? Potentially. All right, so let's cover those in a second here. Let's actually open up, up this real quick. So some dimensions may not have attribute relationships because there's nothing to create relationships with. But most dimensions are going to have that. So let's say, for example, I've got this, this, this date dimension right here. And you'll see I have... Um, I have, I have a, 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 a hierarchy I'm about to create here. This hierarchy is basically going to be my year and my quarter and my month and my day. I'm making it, trying to make it easier for my end users to get to the data. So what I want to do, you'll notice this little warning that pops up. And this warning is telling me that I'm breaking a best practice, that attribute relationships do not exist right now. So the few things in the cube I want to do. First of all, if I look at this date dimension over here, you'll see that right now, I've got a date key, which is a little smart key right here. That's my primary key. And I've also got this column called full date alternate key. So what I've done is I've actually renamed a few of these columns here. My, my full date alternate key is now my date. Now, notice I also have a primary key here as well, though, called date key. So ideally, what I should do is I shouldn't have the primary key and this date key. This is my lowest grain right here is date key. What if I can hijack this column? So when somebody drags a primary key over, they don't see, let me, oh, oh, let me show the tables again, there we go. There we go. So when somebody drags this table over, this, that, that date over, 
I want them to see the full day alternate key, not this. But internally, I want to use this. So that's my goal, and that's what I'm going to accomplish here. That, that tunes our cube even more. So again, I'm going to delete this date key. I'm going to say, I don't, I don't want to use that. That was my old full date. And I'm going to rename this instead to date. Okay, so now I'm going to drag date down underneath that. So I want to reuse this somehow. I want to make sure that when somebody drags over my primary key, they don't see that really cryptic date. I want them to see the real date. So over here in properties, there's a property called name column. So for most tables, you want to hijack the primary key and put your lowest grain. So for a product table, the product SK, the product primary key, will probably be your, your the product names. You'll, you'll drag the primary key over, but then you'll show the name. This allows you to keep one last column in your dimension. And it helps tune some things as well. So I'm going to adjust this name column property. And by adjusting this name column property, I can say, well, SQL Server is going to use a date key behind the scenes, but my users are going to see the full date when they drag it over. So each of your dimension tables, you probably want to do something like that. Okay, so now that ultimately is eliminating some of the columns I need to add. So you want to keep basically what's happening when I go to process this dimension, when I go to reload this dimension. Analysis Services is going to do a select distinct for each of these columns. So if your users are not using the column, you should make sure you eliminate the column also. Going over to attribute relationships, we'll see that right now I've got these attribute relationships lined up. It's the default attribute relationships. Now what happens is when, I dra when a user drags over year, quarter, month, day, what ha what's actually happening, let me zoom in back in again, there we go, is when I go to year, quarter, month, day, I go from year, I go to the primary key down to the quarter, up to the primary key again, down to the month, and then up to the primary key again. So I'm creating a lot of latency going, hopping back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So to tune this, what I want to do is I want to drag the most granular object, in this case a month, onto quarter. And quarter is the next most granular object onto year. Now I've created an attribute relationship that ultimately is much more refined it's going to require a lot less storage now. Now, date, date's not the case, but, but for our product dimensions, it would definitely be the case. Customer dimensions, where I've got hundreds of thousands of customers, this will tune us drastically. Now, I can ultimately, now what happens is if I want to go from a year to a month, I'm allowed to hop over quarter and not even go through quarter anymore. And it's able to kind of easily query that. So it tunes my queries, it tunes my processing, and it tunes other things as well. The last thing we can say is, do I want to, uh, well, I'll, 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 there's a lot more things with the cube that we can do, and I have a whole session on the cube tuning you can find on pragmaticworks.com under webinars. Okay, so a question here from Teresa, uh, why wouldn't you use a primary key name column property for all, a all attributes in the dimension? Well, I could not use it for month, for example. Is that what you're asking, Teresa? Is, is, could, I, could I use a primary key for this also and this for this? Okay, well, the, the grain is different here. So my uniqueness of the date, so let me actually open this data up here. You can kind of see this. So if I were to do it for Friday, for example, this English day name, the uniqueness of this is really the day and the, in this case, the day in the week, right? Or, I'm sorry, the day in the month. So my uniqueness of July, for example, July is not a unique column. So it's not the lowest grain in my data set. July, for example, is only unique if I have the year in, 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 in it as well. So I can't use that primary key for this because it wouldn't be unique data. It, it's, it's kind of all over the place. But th these two really correlate. Your product numbers and your product IDs really correlate. It's the lowest grain in your table. So you can only use that technique for the lowest grain in your table a customer ID and a customer and a customer name. So drag customer ID over and you show the customer name. It's the lowest grain I could possibly get to. So that makes sense there. However, it wouldn't make sense for other attributes because it's not the lowest grain. So it only applies to the lowest grain. Again, there's lots more things inside this we can, we can look at. Uh, one of the things you can look at, of course, also is, is, what, is what we kind of alluded to. Now that I've done this attribute relationship, this month, for example, is no longer unique. I would need to adjust what makes it unique. What makes a month unique, the word January unique, is actually the month name 
and the year. So if I go to my key column property you see right here, I'll select this, and there's a few things I want to do. Well, you know what? Month name is pretty, this is, this is what Analysis is going to use internally for its key. I'm going to remove the month name, and my uniqueness for month, I, let's, let's say I actually have this month number of year, a number from 1 to 12. Let me use that for month name instead, and then year on top of that. So I've got uh, the uniqueness of month is really 2005 January. So that's my uniqueness here. Now also, over in properties, I'll say my name column is just the month name. So what, again, it's what it's doing for me. It's allowing analysis services to use these really tight, tightly coupled keys, numeric keys. However, behind the scenes, I'm, I'm showing the name or I'm showing whatever. So great question here from Mario. I'm sorry, uh, Mauro, excuse me, is what is the difference between an attribute relationship and a hierarchy? Well, let's say, for example, I've got a, a week number as well. Let me just drag over that. I've got a, somewhere here, week number of a year. There we go. The biggest difference between a hierarchy and an attribute relationship, they're not, uh, what, what hierarchies are doing for us is, are, is a more of a usability feature. Attribute hierarchies are a physical feature around how am I going to physically store this data. So, for example, week number of year here. I've got week number of year kind of sitting out here. He kind of relates to a year, doesn't he? So I could drag him over to here, and now I'm seeing a relationship now that I go through for a week, and I also go the same relationship here for a month. So to get to a, a week, I can go through a year, or I can go this way. There's no, there's no hierarchy here set up in any way. I'm just saying you can, you're, I'm going to physically store the data this way. So it, it, I'm, there's, there's relationships between this, so I, can, I don't have to go through a quarter now to get that week. So it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change the physical storing of the data. Okay. So, again, the, the theme of this here is you want to make sure you have attribute relationships turned on, and you also want to try to have numbers represent your keys. Try to go with numbers because it's going to speed up your, your, your dimension. You also want to reduce the amount of, of columns that you have as attributes. The other way we can tune the cube at a high level is also inside the cube itself. Now, there's partitions and there's aggregations. Partitions are going to chop the data up, okay, and it's going to chop it up into smaller chunks, much like you do inside of SQL Server today. Aggregations are much like, I'm sure at some point you've created a table that's a pre-aggregated table that, that rounds your sales up to the maybe the month level. So aggregations work much the same way. They're basically like an index inside of analysis services. To use these, all I have to do is right-click over here and say design aggregation. Now, I want to show you a common mistake we see people make. I'm going to walk to the wizard real quick. I'm going to count the rows. And again, my other session goes deeper in this topic. So if you care about seeing more about this, please go watch the other session we did. It's the recordings already out there. Now, I'm going to make my aggregations until I gain about a 30% gain in performance. So when I hit start, it's going to try to get a 30% gain in performance. So, and I have a connection problem right now. But what I would see is I would see this, this, this number kind of increase. You'll see a huge, uh, very cheap, it's very cheap to aggregate, maybe 10%, but it gets more and more costly the deeper in aggregations I do. So the, the problem I see people do is they say, well, if 10% is good, then 90% aggregation must be even better. So you can see a huge loss in performance by aggregating too much. Think of it like SQL Server. It'd be like creating 200, index, 200 indexes on a single column. Not a good idea, or a single table, excuse me. So too much aggregations can cause a loss in performance. The other thing you can do to, to tune this is, is something called usage-based optimization. You'll see it right here under usage-based optimization, and that can be turned on at an analysis services instance level. So, but right now we're, we're at, uh, the level we're at right now is, is at the, uh, uh, the, the cube level. So the property you're going to see inside of analysis services at the instance level. So by doing that, we're able to watch the queries that are coming into our server and tune for those queries. It makes it much, much more robust to do that. So we can tune for the exact patterns that our users are doing. 
The last thing we see people do oftentimes, which is a great idea, is to warm the cash. In analysis services, what we can do is we can say, well, I know I'm going to get these 50 queries every single day and they're not performing well. So what I can do is I can, I can take those queries, I can create an agent job or an SIS package that runs those queries every single day ahead of my business operation hours. And by doing that, it ultimately will, re will increase my performance immensely because all that data is pre-cached. It's already brought into memory. So again, the theme around this is mainly you want to tune the, tune the query performance with irrigations, and you want to partition your problem as well. Okay. Uh, now typically, uh, the question here about, about SAS versus SAS, I'm not going to speak about another vendor here. I hate to, I hate to down another vendor, but uh, just, just put it this way. Analysis versus, uh, that, there's a cube that, that, uh, that we've seen that, uh, from a major vendor, and another major company out there, that has terabyte size cube instead of a, instead of a, uh, a gigabyte size cube. They have close to 100 terabytes inside of an analysis services environment, and it tunes very well. They had to get less than a two-second SLA, and it's, very, it's pretty easy to achieve that inside of that with analysis services. So yes, you can definitely tune those type of things. Okay, now we have uh, about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure I cover the, the pieces for the data warehouse as well. How do we tune our data warehouse? Well, the theme around the fast track re reference architecture is all about tuning the data to where it's less, it's very, not, it's not fragmented at all. So we want to avoid indexing if at all, if, if, if the data is already pre-ordered, laid down on disk, then ideally we, we shouldn't need as many indexes now, if any at all in many cases. Statistics become incre incredibly important, but indexes minimize. So there's a few, few switches that you want to turn on. First of all, on SQL Server, this is not an always rule, this is a sometimes rule, for a data warehouse load, the dash E switch will give you some advantages. What this is going to do is it's going to get 64 extents at one time as it grows the files, or 4 megs in time. Now that 4 megs is, is optimized for a 64-bit architecture. So the Intel chips, the AMD chips can read data in in 4 mega increments much more efficiently and, and data stored in a 4 mega increment also. So it helps, it helps tune things all the way to the core level. The other thing you want to do is you want to pre-aggregate your data and if you do turn autogrow on, it's going to seem kind of silly, but if autogrow is kicked off on, you want to make sure that you do grow those files in 4 mega increments. It may seem silly, but you want to make sure that everything lines up in that 4 meg increment time. Ideally, again, you want to increase your files manually, but if, auto, if you have Autogrow turned on for, for a, uh, a parachute, just in case, which makes sense, then you want to do 4, four megs at that point. There are some other switches you want to consider turning on also. One is the 1117 switch. This one is going to grow all of my files. So if I, got a, if I have a big data warehouse with 15 files in it, or, or uh, you know, 12 file groups, and each of those file groups has lots of files across all, spread across lots of disk. The T1117 switch is a switch that I turn on typically to make sure that my files will grow evenly across at one time, across all my disk at one time. So if an auto-grow process kicks off, I want to grow evenly on each disk so I don't have one disk that's, that's kind of overweighted on, on, on um, on my requirements. The other one of the switch that maybe you may turn on, and this is not an always rule here, but is trace flag 610. This trace flag will turn on minimal logging into, S into SQL Server. Now, 08 handles this differently than 05, but in 08, if there is, uh, if the data is ordered going into it, and you have a max stop of one turned on for that query, then the data will be turned minimally logged if this trace flag is on. And by, by doing that, it ultimately uh, makes the data less fragmented, as well as the data, the data inserts go up immensely. So we, we're able to put a lot more throughput through this. Okay, so we want to minimize the use of non-clustered indexes also we want to try, for our fact tables. We, have, we want to try to avoid creating a lot of indexes on these frac tables to avoid that fragmentation we talked about earlier. So when you do create indexes for the fast track reference architecture, you want to turn a max stop of one on and sort in TempDB. What this does for you is it makes sure that 
each CPU, you may not know this, but if I, if I have multiple CPUs all processing as index or all doing a bulk insert, what's going to happen is each of those CPUs is going to sort the data themselves. So each data gets, each, uh, each CPU is responsible for sorting its own little tiny piece of the data. So the data is now not being inserted in a sorted manner because I have 15 CPUs all pounding my SQL Server. So you want to avoid that if we all can by turning on max.01. Yes, it will take longer to build an index. However, my select queries go up immensely. My performance, my select queries go up. And my insert performance goes up. So we also want to make sure that the, that the, 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 um, the dimensions that are really volatile, that are changing very frequently, are in a separate file group. And we also want to isolate stage as well to that. Um, yes, a Matthew question about, about the aggregation. I cover a lot more about the performance tuning the cube in my, uh, my, my session on 317 as well. Now, how do we measure this? Well, we, there's, there's two metrics we use. You'll use something called an MCR, max consumption rate, and BCR, bulk consumption rate, benchmark consumption rate. The MCR test is where I basically load what can be cached into RAM. So you, you run a query that you know can be cached that I have enough RAM to cover this. You run it at least twice, once to get it into memory, and then once again. Your goal here at the MCR is to see how much throughput can I really get through this warehouse if there is no I.O. at all, no I.O. problems at all. So the goal of this is just what is my maximum miles per gallon, in other words. In a theoretical test, no wind resistance, nothing is not, no, no resistance at all, I'm going to get this amount of throughput on a server. The BCR is where you load more data that can be fit into RAM, so ultimately it has to read that data off a disk. So this study should be, you know, you sh you're going to see a, a massive degradation of performance here, but you want to test, you test using those two components, see what's what the maximum throughput I get, it, get, and then how much does the I.O. layer add on top of that. So I mentioned the max stop of one. Now you, you also want, when you're loading your data warehouse, to turn max stop of one on for your insert performance. However, SSL with SIS using a destination, you can't govern this. So the only way of really doing this is with a, a feature built in a SQL Server called soft NUMA. And basically what we can do is we can say each port has its own allocated amount of, of resources available to it. So soft NUMA is a really handy way of, of loading data. It, it's basically a registry, registry key setting. And I can say, all right, this, this port, 889, you get this CPU, this port, you get this CPU. So in my connection manager, in the side of SIS, I can connect to a specific port, and then I can limit myself to one CPU. So each package could be governed that way. And by doing that, my data gets laid in on disk, unfragmented there very, very easily. All right, so very, very cool. We can also scale SSIS in our data warehouse in general is by creating a work queue here. Now the work queue, what this does for us is basically we'll, we'll kick off a number of DT execs, each one on its own core, each one using soft NUMA of some sort perhaps. Each one grabs some work to do, processes the work, and then goes to get more work. Now the pro of this is it will ultimately reduce our overall load time immensely. In this case, my little, my little study here from 64 seconds down to about 36 seconds by doing two concurrent processes. The, the con of it is as you add more, that gain starts to minimize. You know, so we're not seeing a huge gain as we do more and more of these. I've got a session um, on just performance tuning SSIS where I cover that. Uh, also a blog on BIDN.com covering that as well. So if you want to check out that blog, it actually walks you through step-by-step -step how to create a queuing system. It's pretty easy and basically involves a batch process like this where I have a batch program. Let's see, do I have it right here? Uh, notepad spawn worker. And you'll see I basically I'm, I'm, I'm kicking off n number of worker threads using DT exec. When I run DT, when I run spawn worker, I'm going to type a number at the end of it, uh, four in my case. What happens is I'll get four DT exec all firing off at the exact same time, and they're not waiting for the result. What's happening behind the scenes is it's ultimately looking at my table here and saying, I see all the work I have to do. Oops, I see all the work I have to do right here. I have to process these uh, eight files. So each server can start to churn through those files. And after they're complete, they, they basically check the work in and check the work out. 
And this can be done for where clauses against DB2, Oracle, whatever. It's a very, very handy way to make this work easily across your environment. So I think I'm about out of time, aren't I, uh, Rachel? Okay, so I, I want my email address up one more time. It's, my email address is b9 at pragmatic. Nope, sorry about that. I realized how, how I ran over time there. Uh, I, by one minute or so. Uh, on the RS side also, there's some, a few things around that. We, of course, want to we want to put the, the, the reporting source to database. On, uh, we wanna, the database want to tune there as a temp one that's being used for data sets. Uh, there's actually a session on our, on our uh, webinar sections of tuning RS as well. Uh, there's a question here from Stephen. I'm sorry, Stephen. Uh, we can also turn on caching there inside of RS. So the first report renders slower, but subsequent ro ro reports run much faster. You can render those reports on a snapshot. So there's a hundred ways we can really tune that, that RS environment as well. Um, okay, well, I I have, I've run out of time, but if you have any questions that I'm missing here, please do email me at b at pragmaticworks.com. Rachel, we have any close? Are you? Um, yeah. That's about it. Uh, as always, our sessions are recorded and they will be available on our website under webinars by the next business day. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Um, the slides will be available for download as well. All thank right. Thank you. I'll send Rachel, I'll send the slides right now to post. Perfect. And uh, thanks a lot, guys. You have a great day. Yep. Have a great day, everyone.